Bitwarden, along with a lot of other password managers, has a feature that allows you to generate time-based one-time passwords. These are the temporary codes you often have to use to sign into websites as part of two-step or multi-factor authentication. This means your password manager can handle both factors in your multi-factor authentication. And uh, that doesn't sit right with a lot of people. I mean, once you put both of your factors into the same place, doesn't this mean you've effectively made it single factor again and wiped out the security benefits? It might be convenient, but is this feature actually a security clanger that fundamentally breaks multi-factor authentication? No. No, it doesn't. I'm going to explain why, because people have been asking. But it's also kind of the wrong question. The real question is, should you be using it? And the answer to that is a bit more complicated. To tackle this one, we need to go back to basics on what multi-factor authentication means, because a lot of people think it means multiple login steps, but this isn't the case. It means proving your identity in more than one way. The generally accepted ways are the inherent factor, something you are, the knowledge factor, something you know, the possession factor, something you have, and the location factor, somewhere you are. To be multi-factor, you have to use more than one factor, not the same factor twice, that doesn't count. Authenticating with two physical devices is still single factor. It doesn't need to be intrusive either. In the first video I made for this channel, I sat down at my computer and it unlocked itself automatically. I didn't need to do anything, but it authenticated me using a 3D infrared scan of my face, and it authenticated the phone in my pocket using Bluetooth. So it was actually multi-factor. Let's apply this to Bitwarden. In our password manager, we have the two factors needed to log into a website. We have a password and a TOTP code. Which factors are these? Your first reaction was probably to label the password as knowledge factor and the TOTP code as possession factor, right? Wrong. How can the password be something you know? You didn't know it. You had to log into a password manager to look it up. What device is a TOTP code proving you have in your possession? If it's in Bitwarden, you can generate it using any device with a web browser. In actual fact, neither of these two items are authentication factors at all, and you're not using them to authenticate yourself. Why? Because the authentication isn't happening here. It happened when you logged into Bitwarden. That is the point at which you had to prove your identity, and hopefully you did use multi-factor authentication to do it. So what are these for if not authentication? This isn't your authentication, it's simply your proof that you have already been authenticated. Let me give you a practical example. If I want to get in a plane and fly to Italy, I need a passport. To get a passport, I need to go through a whole bunch of checks with the passport office. They'll need a bunch of information about me, they might need my birth certificate, my parents' birth certificate, a picture of me, a signature from someone who's known me for many years, and a way to identify them. They'll authenticate me pretty good. But here's the thing. I don't need to do any of that when I get to the airport. I don't have to bring my parents' birth certificate to check in. I don't need to have a friend come along and confirm to the cabin crew that yes, they recognize me. I just hand them my passport. The passport is proof that I have been through that authentication process and that's all they need to see. A lot of the internet works like this too. Let's try this. Open a new tab, incognito, and log into YouTube. When you get to the part where you have to enter username and password, stop. Look at the address bar. You're not logging into YouTube. You're logging into Google. In internet terms, YouTube is a service provider and Google is an identity provider. In our analogy, YouTube is the airport and Google is the passport office. How does YouTube know to let you in? The same way the airport does. It checks you have a passport. In this case, the passport is a signed authentication token provided by Google. But the part I want you to remember is this is just one token. There's no multi-factor going directly into YouTube. There's just a token that acts as proof that you authenticated to Google. YouTube doesn't know or care how many authentication factors you used. That's Google's problem. Back to Bitwarden. This is the same thing again, except it's a kludge. Password managers are a vital tool to make the internet today usable but they're a clutch. They're a workaround for the fact that reusing the same password on multiple sites is incredibly dangerous, and our brains can't remember what feels like infinity complex passwords. We use password managers to clutch in this passport style authentication for sites that don't support it natively. The password manager is our passport office, it's our Google. We authenticate to the password manager. 
That's the authentication that matters. That needs to be multi-factor. The passwords and TOTP codes we get from the password manager and present to the target website are simply the passport, the token. They're not our authentication, they're our proof that we've already been authenticated. At this point, some of you might question whether the second factor TOTP code is even necessary if this stage doesn't really count as authentication. Unfortunately, it is necessary. Remember, this is a kludge. The target website doesn't know any of this is happening, so it still needs to ask for multi-factor authentication, even if the different factors actually come from the same place in practice. I can't rock up to the airport and tell them I forgot my passport, but I'd like them to go at guessing the secret password, please. It doesn't work like that. I can't browse to YouTube and choose to bypass Google and log in via some other means. It's Google or nothing. Because this target website is unaware that I'm using a password manager, it will let people just try and brute force a password. So it needs to have the multi-factor options enabled to protect against that. We also shouldn't just use a password alone as our passport token, because passwords are just terrible for security to begin with. The token that Google issues to YouTube is not a static password. It's different every time, so if one of them gets somehow stolen, it cannot be reused. Using the password in combination with the TOTP code adds some of that security to our kludged passport, because the time-based component means you can't just steal it and then use it again later. Okay, hopefully you're still with me. That's my explanation as to why using this Bitwarden feature doesn't break the concept of multi-factor authentication. Now, the more important question is, should you use the feature? There are some scenarios where it's almost a no-brainer that you should use it, but let me give you an argument against first. Some people don't like to use it because they feel like it's putting all of their eggs in one basket. If your password manager gets hacked and it contains both your passwords and your TOTP codes, then you're pretty much screwed. To those people, I say, yeah, that's a pretty fair take. You should think about this stuff, but that's not to say it's wrong to use either. A lot of people will try to mitigate this risk by having one app for their passwords and another app for their second factor codes, so you need to breach both apps to get into their accounts. Okay, right, let's keep the cogs turning. Where is your password manager most likely to be compromised? Is it in the cloud? It shouldn't be. Bitwarden and any other half-decent password manager will be using zero-knowledge encryption, so if they get hacked, the bad guys just get an encrypted mess that Bitwarden themselves can't read. Realistically, if this is getting hacked in a way that the bad guys get access to your actual passwords, it's probably your device that has been compromised. So let me ask you, do you use your password manager's mobile app? Are your second factor codes in a mobile app? If the most likely breach point is one of your devices, is your phone now the one basket that contains both your passwords and your TOTP codes? I've actually heard of people putting the apps on separate phones because of this. Some people have two phones, one for work, one for personal use, so it's a real thing they can do. Passwords in the personal phone, second factor codes on the work phone. But hang on, don't you need to carry both phones? If you get mugged, are you now the one basket that contains both your passwords and your TOTP codes? Okay, right. Passwords on my phone, second factor codes on my wife's phone. But wait, I spend a lot of time with my wife. What are the chances if she gets mugged, I'm with her and I get mugged too? Is my relationship now the one basket that contains both my passwords and my TOTP codes? We could keep doing this. There's a nearly infinite series of increasingly ridiculous solutions we could contrive and holes we could pick in them. The point is, it's a scale. And the further you go down it, you basically make life harder for yourself and also harder for an attacker. And somewhere along that scale is a point where you will feel that's a good enough compromise between security and convenience. Someone has watched this video and they're now planning to split authentication tokens with their cousin in New Zealand so they both can't get mugged at the same time. A lot of you are probably thinking two phones sounds like too much faff. Some of you will think two apps is too much faff. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. It's down to your risk appetite and the sensitivity of the data in question. Personally, I think that separating your second factor codes from your passwords is a sensible idea, because although it's a little inconvenient for you, it's another barrier to slow down an attacker. I don't think it's strictly necessary though, I think using this feature to store your TOTP codes is fine. It's more secure than what most people are doing, and if your password manager gets compromised, you've realistically got big problems anyway. In fact, I did say there are scenarios where this is something of a no-brainer. The big one is shared passwords. Personally, this is where I would choose to use this feature. In an ideal world, people will tell you shared passwords shouldn't exist and everyone should just have their own. 
That's a nice fantasy you have there. Let me introduce you to my kid's school, where we have one parental login, or a utility bill for which they'll only accept one named person to have an account, or any number of single login devices that we have to look after in the IT world. You have two options here. One, disable multi-factor authentication so your spouse or colleague can share the password. Or two, have a shared TOTP code stored in your password manager, protected by your own unique user accounts and authentication factors on the password manager itself, with access to it tracked and audited. One of these options is acceptable, and it's not the one where you disabled MFA. If you want to sidestep this problem entirely, then the best way to authenticate is not to use a password manager, but to use passwordless authentication. Watch this video to learn how it works and why it's so much better. It feels like we're finally starting to turn a corner in this one. Most of the accounts I've signed up for in the last year support passwordless authentication, and the functionality is built into basically every new device now. Just like the functionality is built into YouTube, so like this video and subscribe to the channel.